Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. It's a thrill to be here. Um, I love sitting next to heroes, and, and Stephen is a hero of mine, as, uh, as John has said, and as I'm sure most of you know, he is uh, one of the leading public intellectuals. There are, very other, there are other phrases one can use, but I hope you accept that one. Uh, in, in the English-speaking world, um, uh, I first encountered him as, as, a, as a linguist, uh, uh, as a man who explained and seemed to be um, Noam Chomsky's um, physical manifestation on Earth uh, in, in terms of his explanation of, of, of some of, of Chomsky's generative grammar and all those things, the language instinct, words and rules, wonderful books like that. And then, of course, the blank slate, um, and one sensed a move then from Stephen, who is a genius in all kinds of areas of, of, of thought, cognition, um, evolutionary psychiatry, um, and, and, and all kinds of areas of neuroscience and language, which are fascinating. But the move from, from writing about language to writing about the blank slate, which while obviously connected to the human mind, one sensed a move towards something a little more political, something a little more addressing what... I think you have seen as a fault in public discourse about the mind and about society and about culture uh, and about intellectuals. Um, and that was picked up with um, the wonderful Better Angels of Our Nature, which shocked people with its optimism. Stephen is now considered a new optimist. Uh, and this wonderful book, Enlightenment Now, uh, a great title and one which I'm sure we can all think, yes, finally, someone has come up and spoken for enlightenment, continues this journey. Um, and so I wanted to say, Stephen, everything you do, I admire, except your spelling of the name Stephen. But um, <laughs> we'll <laughs> overlook that. <Okay. laughs> and if I can ask you, if it has been a conscious or you felt impelled to move from the more academic sphere of linguistics, psycholinguistics, and neuroscience into the cultural sphere? Uh, I, I made the crossover when uh, people would ask what I did for a living, and I would uh, say, well, I study language, how it develops in children, how it works. People say, wow, that's really interesting. And I thought there is a, uh, a market for bringing ideas about language and uh, mind to a broader understanding. And there ha has been, had been a um, breakthroughs in public communication of science in areas like uh, evolution, in uh, cosmology, uh, in uh, dinosaurs. Uh, but no one that I knew of had tried to bring the, the discoveries of cognitive science to a, a broader um, public, and I thought, well, it would be fun, fun to try. Uh, so I wrote The Language Instinct, which tried to explain everything you always wanted to know about language in what I hoped would be an accessible format, and I guess it was an accessible yeah. fo format, because uh, people respond to it, responded to it, and one thing led to another. Right. And then this move from that to, to, to the more, if, if I can say so, political side of it. I mean, you, you might have been looked at as a typical Harvard intellectual academic with sort of left-leaning principles, a, a liberal in the loose sense of the word. But of course, in the last few years, it's as if everything has changed in terms of our sense of what a left or right means. And, uh, and you have infuriated both left and right, <laughs> right. to some extent with, with both the blank slate and then the better angels of our nature. And, um, I, I wonder if you could tell me about your journey in, in that regard. If you think you've stayed the same but the world has changed or you have altered your view of politics and... and... Well, the, um, fr from the uh, position uh, inspired in part by Noam Chomsky that language is a, uh, a human faculty, it's a, one of our innate uh, capabilities, I uh, extended to the question of what are our other innate faculties uh, and in uh, how the mind works I suggested that uh, uh, together with, with language we have a suite of emotions, fear, jealousy, love, uh, anger, gratitude. Uh, we have a set of uh, ways of construing the world, a kind of uh, intuitive physics and intuitive biology and an intuitive psychology. We have uh, aesthetic reactions to the world, um, a, a sense of which landscapes are beautiful versus threatening, which faces are attractive uh, or, or not. And that this suite of psychological reactions could be explained in large part by uh, evolution, the, the forces that give rise to uh, innate uh, uh, mechanisms. 
Uh, but positing a complex human nature, uh, at least for a lot of the 20th century uh, and beforehand, uh, had a kind of a more of a right-wing aroma than a left-wing aroma. Um, despite Chomsky himself, who was of course a, uh, a, a rather flagrant, flagrant uh, leftist, as, as uh, Mitt Romney might, might uh, say, uh, severe leftist. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, he called himself se a severe conservative. Um, so Chomsky did violate that equation, but it, but there there had been a, a, a kind of um, uh, in in traditional liberalism a kind of utopian vision that that uh, was based on on the assumption that uh, human nature was infinitely malleable, so yes. that we could we were not saddled with the with 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 fatal flaws. Uh, we did not have to accommodate human uh, jealousy or. Um, dominance, uh, desire for revenge, differences between the sexes, but with the proper socialization and child rearing, we could engineer society to in turn engineer humans. Yes, Whereas, I mean, in a way, it's, it comes down to the, you know, the very simple nature-nurture debate, that, that you were pushing it more towards nature, it, it, that, that, you know, there was evolution, we were programmed, encoded with certain faculties and uh, ways of perceiving the world and responding to it, as opposed to those being acculturated and the gift of a society in which we were born, is that, I mean, in a is sense, that too although, uh, In a sense, yes, and it, although what, uh, what evolution programmed into us was a set of mechanisms, all of which could learn, because it would be a stupid organism indeed that did not <laughs> respond to information about the environment, right. including other people. Yeah. But, uh, and what I explored further in the blank slate was the, the political and moral and emotional colorings of the nature-nurture debate. Why the nature-nurture debate is not just a scientific debate, but uh, also a, a political one. Yes. And it's because traditionally there, there was at least a, a strand of uh, left liberalism that seemed to be committed to humans as blank slates, as infinitely malleable, whereas uh, there is a, a strain of conservatism that, uh, uh, that uh, began with the assumption that humans are, are uh, tragically limited, that we are uh, innately competitive and jealous and, and also limited in our cognitive faculties with implications such that we can't we're not smart enough to design society from the top down, so we have to rely on uh, distributed bottom-up systems like, like markets. That because humans are perennially tempted by uh, conquest and exploitation, then we need deterrence like the rule of law and armed forces to uh, deter invasions. So you had a kind of tragic vision which was leaned a bit right and you had a more utopian vision, depending on a blank slate, which leaned a bit left. I uh, kind of explored those historical roots and, and then, then tried to scramble them uh, by pointing out that, uh, that it's really not a, a dichotomy, that if human nature is complex, if it has multiple parts, then there isn't a, uh, you don't have to come down on the side that either humans are inherently selfish, tragically flawed, uh, ultimately limited, or infinitely malleable plastic blank slates. That rather we have a, a set of motives, um, some, some of which have uh, regrettable uh, features, like our, our desire for revenge. Um, on the other hand, we also have, there are, are parts of human nature that can um, channel and control and inhibit our darker impulses. We have a capacity for self-control in the, the, our massive frontal lobes. You know, we can count to 10 and save for a rainy day and hold our ho horses and so on. Yes. Uh, we have cognitive faculties, such as the ones, the very ones that I explored in the, in the books on language and the mind. We can have, uh, create new ideas by combining old ideas in, in an combinatorial explosion of possibilities. We can have ideas about our ideas and ideas about our ideas about our ideas. Is that what ideas. you mean by combinatorial and recursive thinking? Indeed. So yeah, recursive that's a big thing of yours, isn't it? Indeed. Yeah. So a recursive representation is one that can contain an example of itself. So every time you say, um, well, uh, I think that uh, he, he thinks that I'm coming, but I'm not, that is you embed one thought within another thought, you're having a recursive yes. thought. And, and that, can, that covers theory of mind and various indeed. other things. Yeah. So theory of mind is, uh, essentially um, depends on, on uh, kind of a recursive yeah. uh, mentalizing. Being able to picture what other people might think. 
Indeed. And so then we, with thanks to language, we also have the ability to learn from each other. And so uh, as society uh, tries out innovative arrangements, and some of them work better than others, we can sh share our ideas about which ones that work and which ones that don't. So there is scope for, uh, for progress, for social improvement, uh, given the, the toolbox that evolution gave us, the, the cognitive toolbox. Right. So in, in, again, using your language idea, it may be true that language, the language instinct, competence, is encoded into us, but that doesn't mean we're all going to speak the same language. Well, it, yes, indeed, that, the, that whatever nature gave us it, it, it is a, uh, a set of systems that are Infinitely designed flexible. to be nurtured in yeah. the sense that yeah. uh, even a capacity for language is not a capacity for, for English or for Japanese. It's a capacity to uh, take in information from our fellow humans and uh, allow us to speak and understand an infinite number of sentences exactly. going forward. And I will, I will share with you my terrible joke, which is that uh, it's actually a mistake to think it's just nature and nurture. Um, it, it's about human will and the passion to succeed, in, in however brutally. So it's really nature, nurture, and Nietzsche. Um, and uh, <laughs> we'll come to Friedrich Nietzsche very soon, because he's very much a bugaboo of yours. Yes. Um, but if, if we now look at this extraordinary book, Enlightenment Now. Um, most people have an idea of what maybe the Enlightenment is. Uh, um, we can think of printing giving rise to the Renaissance, giving rise to science and the age of reason, which then gives rise to what is known as the Enlightenment. And I'd, I'd love you just to sketch briefly, um, you can use your wonderful quotations from Kant, if you like, who himself defined Enlightenment, Aufklärung. Um, I wondered if you could just explain what you see the Enlightenment as meaning. I, I identify three themes as animating the Enlightenment, and they, they form the, most of the subtitle of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, reason, science, and uh, humanism. humanism. Uh, and progress. And, well, which oh, collectively lead to, lead to right. progress, indeed. Yeah. So uh, reason is, uh, comes from the, uh, uh, the realization that traditional sources of belief are, are actually generators of error. Things like authority, tradition, dogma, charisma, hermeneutic parsing of sacred texts, yeah. uh, uh, the subjective glow of certainty, uh, and that there's no substitute for, uh, for, for, for reason. And in fact, uh, reason is, in a very real sense, not, not negotiable. Because it's and, Yes, but also even unreasonable ideologies use reason to justify themselves. Indeed. That's uh, an uh, important uh, point, uh, isn't it? Uh, indeed, that as soon as... Um, you even began to propose some alternative to reason and tried to persuade people why it was better than reason, you kind of lost the argument. Because you're, <laughs> as long as you're not uh, threatening people, as long as you're not am amassing an armed posse to convert people bribing to your cause, <laughs> as long as you're not bribing them, yes. as long as you're giving them reasons, as long as you would insist, if challenged, that you're not full of crap, that, there, uh, that people should take you seriously, then you've, you've surrendered the point. You have, it, it would uh, be like saying there's no such thing as time, and I will tell you about it tomorrow. <laughs> it, it just doesn't make sense. It, yeah, it, if you it, say it, this it, is why there is no reason, the word why is a, a reason word. It, it, precisely, yeah. that's so exactly that, right. And reason, as you say, is the absolute basis, the non-negotiable basis of the Enlightenment. Exactly. Yeah. Then uh, science comes from the conviction that the uh, universe is intelligible, that we can formulate, we can try to explain things, we can, yeah. and moreover, we can, uh, since we can't a priori be certain uh, of any of our explanations, uh, we have an imperative to, to test them, to calibrate them against reality, and to uh, reject the ones that the world tells us are And false. that's what we call sometimes empiricism, for example. The Indeed. testing of the validity and repetitive uh, truth of, of an observation, for example. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, and science, uh, it's often said that science can't uh, give us our values, that there is, uh, it can tell us about how the world does work, but not how uh, it ought to work or how we ought to behave. And that is true as a matter of, kind of a logical uh, categorization, that is a statement of fact and a statement of value are not the same thing. On the other hand,
human uh, well-being. That they, the laws of physics, they just don't care about you. They, they, they don't, if, if you get sick, there, there, is, uh, there, there is no, no uh, entity or, uh, or, or, or agent that wanted you to get sick. Yes. If you fall off a cliff, it wasn't, there's no fate, it wasn't preordained, it's not fulfilling some mission or purpose. Uh, stuff happens. And, and I think if Victorians were as shocked as we think of them as being by Darwin, and actually there's some historical evidence that they weren't quite as shocked as we think they were, it wasn't by the fact that we may have descended from apes or be apes, it was that it presented a, a natural world which was so callous and unfeeling and that we were the result of a simple, what we would now call algorithmic series of rules, not a design and there was no purpose to our life except the shallow purpose of reproduction, as it were. Well, indeed, there's no, and no, no purpose judged by the laws of nature. Of course, once human brains come into existence, uh, humans have purposes, yes. but it's a mistake to project our purposes onto the laws of the cosmos. Yes. Uh, so that, that's an example of a scientific insight that, uh, that has tremendous relevance for, for moral reasoning, including the fact that if we uh, care about our well-being, we can't look to the cosmos to take care of us. Yeah. Um, that, that it's, really, uh, it's really up to us. Yeah. We can uh, test empirically if prayers are answered, after all. And, and, the, the, and the results are in. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, Thoughts more, and more, prayers, uh, nil. <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, uh, and even uh, another scientific insight with enormous implications for, for the human condition is this, the, the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. Yes. That, now, uh, you, that you spend a lot of time in this book talking about entropy, and I'd, I'd love you just to explain why this is more than just a, something that's important to physicists. Yes. The, um, I mean, in the, the uh, technical sense, the, the second law of thermodynamics is that, um, that um, entropy uh, in a closed system um, uh, increases, that is disorder, uh, the heat uh, like goes from a hot body to a cold. It, that uh, differences in temperature, which are uh, necessary for to have usable energy, will inevitably dissipate uh, over time unless the system is exposed to energy or information from the right. outside world. But that closed in closed systems, disorder increases. And in um, uh, one, one implication is that things going wrong um, don't need a, a special explanation in terms of uh, any design or, or, or uh, entity wanting things to go wrong. It's just the natural course of events for uh, things not to go our way simply because there are vastly more ways in which things can go yes. wrong than for things to go right. And so we have to deploy energy and information in order to carve out a zone of beneficial order in our, our local environment with the use of, of energy. And this um, was a recent discovery because it's, you know, we forgive our ancestors for noting above all examples of explosions of energy, volcanoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, mudslides, they would think it was a world in which energy could just appear from nowhere. Yeah, that's true, misled by concentrated local sources of energy, yes. such as the, uh, the Earth's core and, and, and yeah. the sun. And, and one implication of that is that we, we ask the wrong question when we ask, uh, why is there uh, poverty? Uh, poverty is just the, the natural condition of the universe. The question that we should ask is, why is there wealth? And indeed, that was a major uh, obsession of a number of Enlightenment thinkers, uh, Adam, Most Smith famously Adam Smith and his, his uh, um, Scottish and, and Dutch uh, precursors. Yeah. Uh, but it does change the way you look at things if you, you realize that really what we ought to explain is why that we get to enjoy any order, prosperity, life-giving uh, organization at all. So we, we um, live in a world that, um, I think Tom Stoppard put it very well in Arc Arc Arcadia. Do you remember Arcadia, where yes, the, do. the yes. mathematician do, 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 explains, do. If, if I take some rice pudding and it's got a lump of jam in the middle and I take a teaspoon and revolve it five times, the rice pudding becomes pink. If I keep the teaspoon still and revolve it the other direction, I don't get the jam back. <laughs> yeah, right. You never get the jam back. You don't get back. the jam back. And that's, that's right. the rule of the world, not getting the jam. So the, the, the world is, tends towards disorder, decay, uh, as we know, sort of the heat death of the universe and the ultimate uh, uh, story. But, um, and so life itself is pushing up, not just against gravity, but against, it has to find ways of efficiently using heat and calories, energy, work, they're all the same thing essentially, to, to erect a something that will fight the inevitable. 
That's right. So light, the evolution is possible in, in local defiance of the, the law of entry, yeah. meant to be not in defiance of it uh, globally, because living things take in energy from, from the sun or from uh, deep sea ocean vents yeah. um, and, uh, and use it to create zones of order. We do the same thing with our intelligence, where using information, we arrange matter into improbable configurations that, that uh, suit our needs. So science, that's just part of the larger point that a scientific understanding um, doesn't just allow us to build gadgets, but it, it, it does speak to uh, some, our, our ultimate predicament, our ultimate goal, goal in life, uh, which is to um, use information, that is knowledge, to carve out uh, zones of beneficial order in this mass, massive sea of increasing entropy. And then humanism is the, the third major theme, yeah. namely that the, uh, what, what are we using this reason and science in service of? And the answer is uh, broadly human flourishing, where human flourishing would include life, health, happiness, knowledge, culture, um, social uh, warmth and, yeah. uh, and, and, and friendship. Uh, which sounds obvious, who could be against human flourishing? Yeah. But it turns out that, uh, that humanism is actually a rather uh, exotic moral system. <laughs> that yeah. uh, uh, there are alternatives, such as that the uh, ultimate moral purpose is the glory of the, uh, the nation or the tribe or the race, the predominance of the faith, uh, bringing God's commandments to earth, uh, carrying out some um, historical dialectic or messianic uh, age being brought yeah. to, uh, toward reality. So just the concentrating the mind on uh, what's good is to make people uh, healthy and happy and, uh, and knowledgeable and fulfilled, that's a distinct moral commitment. And that I, I identify as one of the contributions of the, uh, the Enlightenment. Now if you put them together, if we deploy knowledge to um, enhance human flourishing. And I should mention one other ingredient, which is a big theme of the Enlightenment, is that all of this is, the, the uh, humanism is possible because we're endowed by evolution, they, they didn't put it that way, but we put it that way now, with a sense of sympathy, with the ability to feel each other's pain, to uh, have a, a concern with the well-being of others. Now, the sense of sympathy that evolution gave us is rather puny. Uh, it applies naturally to our genetic relatives, to our, uh, our trading partners, our yeah. members of our clan, but it can be pushed outward by uh, forces of cosmopolitanism, by, that is by mixing of people and ideas, and by reason itself, that if you have to um, exchange uh, ideas and values with other people, it's rather hard to maintain that my interests are special and yours aren't because I'm me and you're not. Now I can say that, but I can't get you to take me seriously. And as soon as I have to negotiate agreements in larger uh, circles of individuals, I'm uh, forced to expand my circle of, of sympathy outward and to treat uh, other people and ultimately other sentient creatures as equivalent in interests to my own. So in a sense, the altruism that might have evolved in order for us to help our own specific kin group or tribe or clan or small group, an altruism that, as it were, allowed uh, sacrifice for the, for the greater good of a small uh, group to which we belonged, can be applied to a much, much larger group. That's, that's right. And that, that's an idea. Uh, Darwin himself um, proposed this idea. He said that once, the, once we have the capacity to sympathize with others, and we uh, societies get larger and more complex, there's nothing that can prevent it from um, uh, expanding to en encompass the uh, an entire uh, human species uh, once that's set, set in motion. Yeah. Now, if you take these, these three, the three ideas of, of reason, science, and humanism, uh, and say that, that beginning with the Enlightenment, there's been the goal of uh, understanding the world and uh, applying such knowledge to uh, improve human flourishing, then one uh, ought to enjoy progress. That is, uh, sometimes we solve the problems that face us, we accumulate the solutions that work, and over time, uh, human flourishing should increase. Now, and, this and those problems are probably best characterized by the four horsemen of the apocalypse, war, pestilence, famine. What's the fourth one? Anybody? 
Death, obviously, yes. Death, yeah. Okay. Death. Seems kind of... We're, we're looking forward to the end of this century. Yes. Uh, the... Seems kind of redundant. Yeah, it does, really. Three. Yeah. <laughs> but it really the, could be it, three horsemen. In, in a sense, that's yes. what they can address, yes. which were the hugest problems mankind faced for millennia. Yeah. I, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, all of which are uh, concomitants of the fact that we uh, evolved by evolution in a universe governed by entropy. And yes. death is the ultimate kind of entropy yes. as far as humans are concerned. Our bodies um, merge with the soil eventually. Yeah. 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 But um, so that, that, that's the hope. And then one could ask, well, the Enlightenment ideal of progress sounds good in theory. Um, you know, how did that Enlightenment thing work out? And uh, that's what you have become very well known for is, is, is taking a lot of time, patience, and indeed graphs to explain how, in fact, that Enlightenment <laughs> project has, in your opinion, worked. First with the better angels uh, uh, of our nature, uh, and, and now with this. You, you, you really are very, very keen to, to show in every aspect how, across different nations and different parts of the world in different times in history, uh, the, the, the uptick of, of Enlightenment has, has served mankind. That's right. Now, two, 200 years later, we can, we can answer the question. Uh, and the, the question is, there's been enormous progress. Uh, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can graph it, and I did. And uh, th <laughs> th thanks in large part to uh, the, the works of uh, Max Roser, who is here, the Oxford economist, who's the proprietor of uh, the website Our World in Data. Uh, but thanks to that and other so publicly available sources of data on uh, human flourishing, you can uh, answer the question, have we made progress or not? Well, to take a, just one example, through most of human history, life expectancy at birth was around uh, 30. Uh, today, in the developed world, it's uh, greater than 80. And in the world as a whole, it's uh, 71. And very, very few people guess that it's that high. Um, so. Uh, the, 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 the ultimate good, the ultimate resource, life itself, mm -hmm. has vastly increased. Uh, partly it's because of the reduction in uh, childhood mortality. Yeah. In, uh, even in a, uh, a, what we think of today as an a, a affluent, healthy country, Sweden, uh, almost a third of Swedish children died before the age of five uh, a little more than 200 years ago. And then the rate of child mortality um, plummeted in the 19th century. And what Sweden went through, uh, then other countries went through, including today's, uh, the countries that tragically still have the highest rates of child mortality, such as in sub-Saharan Africa, but their rates are, are uh, plunging as well. And similar stories can be told for um, uh, education. The world is becoming literate. Uh, a, I think it's on the order of uh, 80% of the world can read or write, whereas the historical average, even in Europe, was closer to 10 to 15%. And the people who are illiterate tend to be in their 60s and 70s. Right, and so so we, dying, know, uh, we know which way the trend is going. <laughs> yes. uh, and girls as well as boys, so the world is approaching um, uh, gender equality in education and literacy. Uh, it's, you also see uh, progress in uh, violent crime in uh, uh, any region that beyond the reach of the law in frontier regions, in the, the uh, kind of anarchical, feudal patchwork of medieval Europe, there were rates of homicide that were 30 to 50 times higher than what we see in European countries today. this is not today. war, you're talking about No, this crime. is, this, this yeah. is yeah. Uh, highwaymen and brigands and right. uh, barroom bar fights <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, 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 and ladies slipping arsenic into their husband's <laughs> tea and uh, all, all of those kinds of personal violence. So that's plunged, yeah. including even in, in uh, an, uh, an outlier for a lot of these trends. Uh, is at least among Western democracies, is the United States. The United States is, uh, paradoxically, given how prominent it is uh, among Western democracies, is, is uh, something of a, of a laggard in a lot of these dimensions of human Or basket well case, you might say. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> or head, at least heading that way. But even in the United States, the rate of violent crime has been reduced by 50% uh, in the last uh, 25 years. Uh, perhaps less obvious uh, that war has been in, in decline, uh, you know, not to zero, and the, the civil war in uh, Syria has been the, the worst war in a generation. But even with the, the Syrian civil war, the overall rate of death in warfare is a fraction of it, what it was in the, say, in the 80s when the Iran-Iraq war raged, when the uh, uh, Soviet presence in Afghanistan led to um, a horrific fighting for a, a decade. There were civil wars across Africa and Latin America. 
With the signing of the uh, peace agreement in Colombia in 2016, the last war in the Western Hemisphere came to an end and the last remnant of the Cold War. So five-sixths of the world's surface now is at peace, including areas like Southeast Asia, and for that matter, Europe, yeah. which were just blood, red with blood for, for centuries. Um, and uh, an entire category of war, uh, war between uh, nations, particularly war between great powers, might be uh, uh, obsolescence, obsolescent. The last great power war was the, the uh, Korean War in 1953. But then other, uh, you can say, well, those are all uh, kind of the measures that, you know, economists care about. What do they have to do with, with uh, uh, the quality of life and the meaning of life? Well, uh, if you look at what you might want to consider to be indices of uh, a meaningful life, like uh, leisure time to spend with family and culture as opposed to the drudgery of housework. Well, if you, thanks to the penetration of electricity, running water, uh, washing machines, um, uh, electric stoves and refrigerators, the amount of time that we spend on housework, which really means the amount of time that women spend on housework, <laughs> has gone from something like 60 hours a week to 20 hours a week. Yeah. Uh, uh, the number of hours that we work has fallen by about uh, 20 hours a week in the, in the last century, from, from the days of uh, Bob Cratchit and the uh, <laughs> Christmas Carol. Uh, and so with the combination of less time devoted to housework and less time spent at work, the amount of leisure time has increased, both for men and for women. For women, it leveled off in the uh, 90s, and I was kind of puzzled about this. In fact, even had a bit of a dip. The reason is that women spend more time with their children today. So a working mother or a single that I plotted, right. uh, that, that's okay. what they found. Because that's obviously people will, I mean, you know, the Free Economics book, for example, would say that American crime rate has gone down because abortion rates went up at exactly the time that a generation of criminals would have been born that weren't up because of yeah. Wade versus Roe. I'm sure you've read yeah. that oh, book. Yes. Oh, nice. um, it turns, that turns out not to be, it, it falls into the category of uh, too cute to be true. Ah, right, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So it's, uh, it, that turns out, I mean, it was an ingenious theory, it's, it's, it's not the right thing. And, and anyway. obviously one of the first things that would have been put to you, because a lot of people will be hissing and saying, ah, but, ah, but, ah, but. Um, we, we're used to damning our own culture, uh, to, to, to seeing it as destructive, to seeing science as ruining the world, uh, you know, from going from a biosphere, you know, well, from a geosphere to a biosphere to a noosphere, or, or if we now like to call it the Anthropocene, you know, that we have altered Mother Earth, um, and also all these things you've said have brought us so much leisure time and uh, uh, peace and uh, prosperity, surely they've also brought us anxiety, unhappiness, suicide, um, and this is the illness that, that, are, uh, that, that is the price we pay for all the benefits that the Enlightenment may have given us. But you address this in the book as well. Yes, so I have a, a yeah. chapter on happiness yeah. where I... Um, uh, look at data on just self-reported happiness. You just ask people, how happy are you? I mean, who could be a better judge? Uh, <laughs> or imagine yourself, imagine the worst possible life that you can imagine and the, let's call that uh, the bottom rung of a ladder and the best possible life you can imagine, that, let's call it the, the top of the ladder and there are 10 rungs. What rung would you, would you say you're, you're at? That's another way of asking a, a related but not identical question. When you, when you, when you do that, you find that uh, in a majority of countries for which we have data over time, happiness has increased. But more, uh, that only gives you a, a, a sample of countries where the data go back. They don't go back that far. On the other hand, we also find that those data tend to correlate um, with, um, with GDP per, per capita. Uh, so contrary to the idea that money can't buy happiness, I mean, it can't, you know, exactly for every individual, but, but on average it kind of does. And so as the world has gotten more affluent, and, and all countries have gotten more affluent, uh, affluent there's reason to believe that, uh, that world happiness has, has risen. As for uh, depression, uh, anxiety, psychopathology, there's a widespread belief that we're, we're suffering from a new epidemic of, uh, of, of mental illness, particularly um, depression. Um, but it turns out not to survive fact-checking, that um, there's been more uh, 
uh, awareness of depression. There's more, I mean, uh, uh, as you know, diagnosis, and also um, remo removal of stigma so that people uh, share their experience of, of uh, suffering from depression, which has the beneficial effect of having other people um, coming out and, and uh, no noting their own and, and getting uh, treatment, yeah. which, is, uh, which, which, is, which can be effective. But it leads to an illusion that depression has actually increased. And the surveys that try to apply a constant yardstick over the decades uh, suggest that it, that it has not. Yeah. Uh, a bit like um, homosexuality, because mad gay people like me have come out, uh, it seems there are more of us, but in fact <laughs> it's simply that we're noisier, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, um, and then there's the, you know, Thomas Piketty and others have focused on uh, the issue of inequality, that it seems to be going that way. Um, and you also have things to say about that that are quite sort of, wow, eye-popping yeah. to some extent. Yeah, so, yeah. um, so inequality can me be measured a lot of different ways. Yeah. This is something that I discovered as I kind of uh, uh, sank further and further into the inequality you know, tar pit. <laughs> uh, uh, even, it's very hard to, even to get an economist to say, well, what exactly is the Gini index for the United States in the year you know, 2015? And you can get like five different answers depending on how it's calculated. But uh, a couple of things I was able to establish from, from a, this dip into the literature and partly with the help of uh, our world in data. Uh, one is that globally inequality is, uh, is decreasing um, that, that across the planet that whether it's measured in comparisons uh, across countries where each country is a unit, or as best we can estimate it in the global population, uh, inequality is decreasing, and that's just because um, poor countries are getting richer so much quickly, more quickly than rich countries are getting richer. Uh, and, uh, and, and one of the, uh, an, uh, an astonishing fact of progress that, it, that we didn't, um, discuss in, in when I went through the list is that global poverty is de decreasing, global extreme poverty, I should say, uh, defined by the World Bank as a uh, dollar uh, ninety uh, per day in, in international um, dollars, uh, uh, kind of an arbitrary cutoff for the ability to feel, feed yourself and your, and your family. By some historical estimates, the rate of extreme poverty 200 years ago was about 90 percent. That is about 10 percent of the world was not extremely poor. Now, uh, it's, the figures have reversed, and uh, 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 less than 10% of the world is extremely poor. Um, so because of this massive uh, increase in the fortunes of the worst off, in countries like uh, China and Bangladesh, and uh, in some, many of the sub-Saharan African countries uh, in, in Latin America, uh, global inequality has, has uh, decreased. Now, Unquestionably, inequality has increased within uh, many Western wealthy countries, particularly for whatever reason, uh, English-speaking ones, yeah. uh, uh, England, United States, uh, Australia. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I suggest that inequality is not in its, economic inequality, uh, is not in itself a, uh, an evil, that it's, it's practically impossible to avoid in any kind of uh, economy that isn't uh, imposed from the top down by totalitarian means. And as Walter Scheidel uh, points out in his new book, uh, The Great Leveling, the most effective ways, if you really want to reduce inequality, uh, the most effective ways are violent revolution, um, pandemics, yeah. um, mass mobilization warfare, and state collapse. Uh, <laughs> which kind of should remind us that, any, as he puts it, be careful of what you wish for. Yes. And I think that the moral imperative is really not inequality per se, uh, but it's some of the co possible concomitants of inequality. One of them is political inequality. Uh, anger, the, resentment. Uh, those and, and the fact that the, the, the rich have too much political influence, uh, right. yes. uh, especially yes. in the United States. But yeah. also, but really morally, what, what ought to uh, attract our concern is, is poverty, is how much people yeah. at the bottom have, not how big is the gap between them and, the, and those at the top. And there, thanks to... Uh, well, in, in especially in developing countries, thanks to uh, uh, market economies that have been growing and, and um, globalization, um, there's been a massive increase in the fortunes of the poor. In wealthier countries, the, uh, the, the welfare state has put a floor under the um, uh, poverty levels. And so even in the United States, which is 
famously libertarian compared to its um, Western peers. The United States has a, a pretty substantial welfare state, and as a result, poverty, when it's measured in absolute terms, not in terms of uh, percentage of, uh, of, of the um, income of the population, mm -hmm. but in terms of what people can afford, can you afford to feed yourself and clothe yourself. Travel has, to other countries. Travel so, to other countries. Yeah. It's fallen from about, depending on how it's measured, from about 30% of the population in uh, 1960 to something like 5% of the population now. When it's measured, taking into account government benefits and the uh, falling cost of many goods and services. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and I, uh, what I suggest is that it's really poverty that morally that we ought to concentrate on and not so much inequality. Absolutely. And so, Taking your book, you lay out an argument that the Enlightenment and what followed it as a result of open thought, free reasoning, and, and, and all the advantages of science and humanism that led to industrial revolutions and, and yes, all kinds of new sorts of poverty, but has brought us to a, not exactly a shining mountain top, but to a place which was unimaginable even 50 years ago to some extent in terms of war, starvation, and, and these other I in indexes, indices that you, you go by. So the book might have stopped there, but of course, really, you could, you could subtitle it, not the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress, but you know, the enlightened society and its enemies uh, with, <laughs> a, with a bow to Hayek. So why is it that we as children, grandchildren, great, great grandchildren of the enlightenment, seem to be so disrespectful of it, so doubting of it, so cautious, so skeptical? Why yeah. don't we accept that it has given us everything we have and speak its language? Yeah, and, and it's um, uh, an important theme of the book is that the, this progress does, isn't, isn't some mystical uh, upward uh, pointing arc. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not some historical dialectic that inevitably makes us b better and better until we reach utopia. Um, it, it's a result of uh, sp specific efforts to solve problems and to uh, retain the, the solutions that are effective. And that if there is uh, an abandonment of that principle, then progress can, could go into reverse. And there, there, of course, there have been catastrophes where it has gone into reverse. And there are threats today in uh, authoritarian populist movements that explicitly reject a lot of the, uh, the themes in the institutions of the Enlightenment, uh, such as Trumpism in the United States and, and some of the populist movements in Europe, um, as opposed to universal human flourishing. They, they uh, prioritize the, the greatness of the, of the nation, right. the, the glory of, of, of uh, Russia or the greatness of the United States, as opposed to institutions of global cooperation, which were a, a theme of the Enlightenment. There's the, the idea that there should be zero-sum competition uh, between nations vying for, for greatness, um, as opposed to a, uh, a reliance on science and reason. There's uh, an in invoking of religion and uh, a, a re-empowering of uh, religious factions. Uh, there are often specific pushback against uh, scientific discoveries such as vaccine, vaccines yes. and... Uh, a story in the papers today about from the WHO talking about the huge rise in, in uh, measles in, in Europe as a result of, of uh, people I not mean, vaccinated. A self-imposed wound. Yes. We, we kind of are, are on, the, on the verge of licking that. Uh, yeah. So there... Are, so the, and the question is why in an age of, uh, of progress behind us are we suddenly facing these new, these new threats? Now, partly it's because there are, um, I think there are, there are features in human nature that uh, have uh, always made uh, authoritarianism, tribalism um, uh, appealing, that a lot of the ideas of the Enlightenment are rather exotic discoveries that are enormously beneficial, but they don't come naturally to the human mind, and they've got to be kind of relearned and, and uh, redefended every generation that it's much uh, more natural to think of the inherent goodness of, of my clan and to imagine that the chief Im directly embodies the inherent goodness and virtue of my clan, as opposed to the Enlightenment idea, uh, most specifically articulated by the American um, uh, framers, that, uh, that political leadership should just be a, uh, basically a bunch of committees with a committee chair that is uh, given the responsibility of 
keeping people from each other's throats and for encouraging commerce, but that must live by rules that justify whatever power we uh, apply to them, yes. as opposed to a strong man who is... Uh, because, um, I mean, using America and the Enlightenment and the, you know, the beautiful white columns of, of Washington and the, you know, the, 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 the phrasing of the Declaration of Independence and so on, um, uh, a lot of Americans, less than 100 years after uh, America became a country, were puzzled beyond belief why a country set out on such perfect enlightenment principles and ideals should have descended into such appalling carnage, the most bloody internecine civil war still to this date in history in its civil war, the murder massacre of species of animal, and to us more importantly, huge tribes of Native American peoples uh, in the cruelest possible way, gangland violence beginning in all the cities. This was a country founded in exactly Enlightenment principles, written down by Jefferson, who is a, one of the heroes of the Enlightenment, uh, influenced by Paine, another hero of the Enlightenment, and by Franklin, and these, these glorious people, were, but they still believed in slavery. Um, uh, and the Enlightenment gave rise first and foremost to colonization, the enslavement and the exploitation of native peoples, of ordinary people uh, conquered in their lands. And so there's a way of seeing the Enlightenment as having been like a virus. And you can see why people in the third world might say, well, your Enlightenment didn't enlighten us. It was either you're changing your missionary stance from being a Catholic or a Methodist missionary to being an Enlightenment missionary. But I'm being a devil's yeah, avocado. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. No, I, I think it's, uh, I do think it's, uh, it is certainly true that one mustn't identify the Enlightenment uh, with the, the West, uh, and particularly not with the United States, even though the United States Constitution and Declaration of Independence were magnificent Enlightenment statements. Yeah. But uh, the Enlightenment uh, clearly didn't, didn't penetrate uh, large parts of the United States, which retained more of a kind of a, a manly culture of honor as a way of organizing society rather than principles justified in uh, um, uh, a set of propositions. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's lo long been in the United States a divide more or less coinciding with the North and the South uh, as to whether society should be organized by institutions justified by Enlightenment principles or by individuals um, uh, defending themselves and their, their interests by uh, defending their honor. Um, slavery, of course, was not is as old as civilization. Uh, the, Slavery is pretty much the, the rule rather than the exception until the 18th century. Yeah. Um, all of the so-called great civilizations were, were uh, slaveholding civilizations, including so-called democratic Athens, yeah. including Rome, including all the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Bible, biblical yeah. civilizations. Yeah. Um, and that was carried over and, uh, and expanded in the, um, in, in, um, the Europe. A Christian might say, of course, that it was um, you know, uh, m mostly Christians, uh, uh, well, mostly dissident cr Christians, who, who first uh, uh, who first suggested, you know, Wilberforce people like that. Well, it was Quakers. Uh, and Quakers, but not indeed, all, yes. But not the all least. My side is Jewish, my father's side is Quaker. So, so. Okay. <laughs> yes. um, um, but yeah, so I, I, I think it's, a, it's an anachronistic to uh, to connect the, 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 the slave trade with, with yes, the Yes, I, I suppose the point I'm making is yeah. religionists might argue that their religion, whether it's Islam or Christianity or Buddhism, is almost like a sort of serum, like, a, like Oliver Sacks' L-Dopa. You, you inject it in someone and they instantly have a structure and a way of looking at the world which can transform them and they can live by. But if you believe in um, the Enlightenment and, and the, the four pillars of it that you've, uh, uh, you know, adumbrated then, then, uh, or laid out, um, then that isn't a serum. It, it clearly doesn't, it's not a magic bullet. It doesn't transform you or the world. It's, it's a series of ways of working towards yeah. something. It's much tougher than a religion. It's not magical yeah. thinking. <laughs> right, and so there is a, a challenge, and I, I, I end the book by uh, wondering whether uh, as many uh, cultural conservatives claim um, that modern secular humanism, uh, liberal cosmopolitanism, enlightenment values are just too tepid to engage uh, human uh, 
um, animal spirits, that yeah. they just, they won't fire people up, yeah. uh, and that religion will never go away because it speaks to deep yearnings in the soul, and likewise with nationalism. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of that for a number of reasons. One of them is that uh, societies that, that most carry out uh, enlightenment principles, the, the, the secular uh, Western democracies like New Zealand and Denmark and Canada are, um, they don't seem to be collapsing in spiritual uh, anime. They seem to be rather pleasant places to live. People seem to be doing just fine. They don't seem to be um, you know, uh, joining ISIS in great numbers to give meaning to their lives. Uh, they also are the main destination of people who vote with, vote with their feet. I mean, everyone wants to go to the, 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 the great Enlightenment countries. That, that, that's where, that's including true. the people from the the, the, the religiously excit excitable zones of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't want to stay there, they want to go to Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I raised the question of whether, uh, do, we need, do, do we need the kind of secular humanist equivalent? Do we need uh, you know, uh, uh, humanist preachers thumping copies of Spinoza's ethics on the, on the pulpit? <laughs> and, uh, well, it, you have, I won't say suffered, but you and, and people we know, uh, Christopher Hitchens when he was around, and uh, Richard Dawkins, and uh, Sam Harris, and uh, Daniel Dennett, and, and others, have been regarded as almost evangelical, fundamentalist in your humanism, your secularism, and so on. Um, how would you... I, mean, I, don't, I don't think that that's uh, true. I mean, it's certainly not, not true of me, and, it's, yeah. and I, don't think, I don't think it's true of the, the so-called uh, uh, the four horsemen of the new atheism, yeah. uh, Hitchens, Harris, Dennett, and um, uh, Dawkins. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, paradoxically, the, the critics of secular humanism who say that it doesn't uh, speak to the human spirit are almost calling for exactly that, like, well, your movement isn't going to succeed until you have your evangelical prophets yes. of, of secular humanism. And, you know, do we need to have you know, you know, humanist congregations where people kind of <laughs> roll back their eyes in ecstasy and babble in Esperanto? <laughs> or, or, uh, but there was or, a man who I'm sure you knew as yeah. I did, who was a very ornery and uh, enraging man, but a very brilliant one in his own way, Stephen Jay Gould, oh, yes, the, the, right. the paleontologist. He I think he was the man who first proposed what, what he called noma, the, the non-overlapping magisteria. In yes. other words, um, he saw that where science and religion or spirituality, uh, they can have their own magisteria, their own realms, their own domains. I think it's ultimately very unsatisfactory because it's impossible for science not to you know, look at everything. Um, but what, what yes. is your view of that? That you know, whereof we should not speak, we should remain silent because Wittgenstein, an enemy of of scientism um, said, right. what's your, how do you speak to that? Well, well Steve Gould didn't seem to grasp that you, could ha that, he, that you could have a morality that did not depend on religion. He yeah. kind of gave religion the franchise for, for morality. He yes. said, you know, science can't dictate our morals, and strictly speaking, that's true, uh, although I think it can be exaggerated. Uh, therefore, it's religion's job. But he kind of missed out on the whole enlightenment thing that you can justify morality in terms of, I mean, you could do it on utilitarian grounds, yes. that what makes the largest number of people well off is moral. You could do it on deontological grounds. There are certain principles like Kantian. life and choice, Kantian yeah. grounds. Yeah. And you don't or the give, social contract, I suppose, is the other The social option. contract, yeah. indeed. But yeah. And you don't have to uh, call in a, uh, a deity to do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, for, all, for all of Steve's vast erudition and, and knowledge and uh, uh, he, he kind of missed that the whole enlightenment principle. I mean, that was, I, I think, was a uh, uh, something of a vacuum in his. Uh, Some in his Stevens landscape. can be wrong. Now, <laughs> I, I, I wanted just to quote one thing, which really fascinated me, because it might be a criticism leveled at you that here, when, when you talk about reason, um, you use two um, archetypes, as it were, two opposites, um, and and you miss out the middle. And I think. Perhaps that's an interesting idea. You, you, you say opposing reason is by definition unreasonable. Um, that hasn't stopped a slew of irrationalists from favoring the heart over the head, the limbic system over the cortex, blinking over thinking, McCoy over Spock. And um, now you, you may say, well, talking Star Trek seems a bit silly, but actually um, this is gonna bring me to our dear friend Nietzsche. Now Nietzsche in his book, The Birth of Tragedy, he, he pulled on two Greek gods, Dionysus and, and Apollo, to try and explain two sides of human nature, what 
Freud might have called the id and the uh, superego or the ego, I have to tell which it is. In other words, the Greek tragedy as he saw it was, was playing off on the tensions between the tribal, bloodlust, frenzied side of our animal selves and this rational, Apollonian, harmonious side of ourselves. And oddly enough, and Gene Roddenberry was a genius, if you look at Star Trek, there is McCoy, who's always going, you green-blooded monsters, fuck. <laughs> and Spock is saying, fascinating. That one, of them is, one of them is logic, you know, how can your logic account for that, Spock? And, and McCoy, the doctor, is physical and primal and emotional. But the whole point is in the middle is Kirk, Kirk. Who, who tries to be both. That they will go to a planet which is all id, and Kirk will try and explain that <laughs> there is such a thing as reason and order, or they will go to one that is all order. And he will try and say, where is your humanity? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you really do have it in for, for Nietzsche because you see the, the, the neo-Nazi, or not neo, crypto or proto-Nazi side of, uh, of Nietzsche, this, the, the man and Superman, which some people regard as a, a fiction that he was putting forward, not the app, although he did die mad, so it's very hard to know. But I just wanted to see, you know, the, the whole, the romantic movement constantly crashed waves against the wall of the Enlightenment, uh, and it's still doing it today, that romantic sense of the individual, the maverick, aside from the tribe. And, and it can become insane in Nazism or Ayn Randism, or, but, but it also is something we can instinctively feel for, can't we? Yes, and I think, I think it can lead to some great, great art, great plot lines, but it isn't much of a way to organize politics in society. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I might add, uh, quoting from a, uh, a great figure, um, you would not enjoy Nietzsche, sir. He's fundamentally unsound. Jeeves! <laughs> Jeeves, yes, that's exactly. Right. Yes. That's absolutely right. Bring, Jeeves like Spinoza. <laughs> Jeeves like Spinoza, and to bring it... A good Jewish bring, philosopher. <laughs> exactly, and, and to bring it home, uh, Captain Kirk was played by a, uh, a fellow uh, Montreal Jew, uh, William Shatner. Of course. Who was a, a lanceman, <laughs> a, uh, part of my, my tribe. So. Now, it's good you mentioned Canada because you are, of course, Canadian. And I suppose there is, you know, the archetype public intellectual Canadian was the great Marshall McLuhan, a man of extraordinary influence to this day, whose prophecies and sense of how society would uh, respond to what he famously called the global village and uh, uh, the anxieties that the, 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 the written word, the first information age movement uh, would bring about. And uh, you read him today and it's still pretty astonishing. He's quite difficult to read sometimes, but an extraordinary man. And you have fitted this uh, role as um, as, as a Canadian uh, public intellectual too. And the third man who's recently come rather into the news is Jordan Peterson. Um, and while most people would have thought, well, there's Steven Pinker, he's a you know, liberal humanist, and there's this Jordan Peterson, is he perhaps a bit right-wing? He, does he sort of dog whistle a little for the alt-right? There was a famous, uh, I'm sure you saw his interview here on Channel 4 television, did you, with did. Kathy Newman? And, um, did, yes. Now, for those who don't know, he's, a, he's also, a, like you, a, a psychologist psychologist, essentially, That's isn't right. he? Yep. Um, and he's written um, some very successful uh, books. Um, I, but you both, I think, meet on your detestation of what you might call, what he would certainly call cultural Marxism in the campus. And you yourself have suffered from some extraordinary blowback on that. And I'd love to just to share the story of what happened to you recently when you spoke about, very sensibly, about the nature of, uh, you know, uh, deplatforming and all the things we are aware of in, uh, in American, particularly American academic institutions. Yes, I, I participated in an event at uh, Harvard organized by the Open Campus Initiative, which is a student organization uh, dedicated to free speech, belying the common accusation that the entire millennial generation doesn't get the concept of free speech yeah. and they're just social justice warriors and snowflakes. And so these are our, our Harvard students who are uh, qu quite adamant in de defending at what they, they call an open campus in conjunction with um, uh, Spiked magazine here in the yeah. UK. And the panel that they convened was, um, did political correctness help elect Trump? And they had it on the close to the anniversary of the uh, uh, Trumpocalypse, yes. yeah, sorry, November, November 8th. Uh, and they had, uh, they had me, they had Wendy Kamner, a well-known Boston area civil libertarian, uh, and uh, Brendan Jones. Um, and the, uh, a number of us argued that uh, obviously the, the Trump 
victory had a number of causes, but one of them was that there is a, was a, there's certainly a sector of the population that voted for uh, Trump despite his you know, flagrant um, uh, uh, um, unsuitability for, for, for the job uh, as a reaction to, uh, to, to the um, uh, stifling of uh, opinions in uh, forums such as uh, uh, college campuses. And in particular, this is true of the, uh, I pointed out, of the alt-right. And by alt-right, I don't mean the skinheads with the tiki torches, the neo-Nazis, but rather the rather uh, highly educated, often tech-savvy, uh, young, uh, almost exclusively men, yeah. who uh, find themselves, uh, come across um, just empirical facts that are undiscussable in college campuses, such as the fact that different ethnic groups don't have the same crime rates, that uh, men and women aren't indistinguishable, that uh, capitalist uh, economies are um, more, more efficient and more humane than, than um, uh, uh, communist ones. Uh, and they find them, themselves immediately uh, stomped on like a ton of bricks if, they, if, if uh, any of these facts are so much as mentioned. They um, withdraw, uh, uh, assuming that there are certain uh, truths that the mainstream establishment can't handle. Then they spin them in the most uh, toxic possible directions because they've never had a chance for these uh, opinions to be put into context, such as the fact that there are differences between the sexes uh, doesn't mean that uh, sexism is justified. No, because no kind of corollary. Fairness, yes. Because fairness and yeah. sameness are not the same thing, to, to quote yeah. uh, Helena Cronin. Um, that uh, all abilities that show differences in the means show enormous overlap in the distributions, such as that for any, for, there are a number of traits in which uh, men on average are uh, better than women, but many traits for which women are better than men. Yeah. Uh, likewise, the fact that there are differences in the crime rates now for uh, African Americans and uh, whites is just part of a general pattern that there are always differences. In but those secondary of, explanations, those glosses on the statistics, aren't got to because they never got to because everything is closed down. You're not allowed to say there is more crime here than there. You're not allowed to say there are differences between genders here. Exactly. So you don't come across so even, other equally relevant facts. Can't even explain facts. them. Like, it used to be that yeah. that that, that, that uh, Irish Americans had higher crime rates than yeah. Protestant Americans. That was a gap that uh, that disappeared, and so the black-white gap could disappear as well. Yeah. But if you only get the, uh, the taboo fact and not the, the context and the arguments that uh, prevent you from taking that fact and yeah. uh, drawing uh, uh, harmful consequences, then you will draw the harmful consequences. And you said and the as result, much at this yeah, meeting. And the, and and the result is the, the alt-right. And, and, and I, the reason that I know this has happened, uh, this is not speculation, is that I've gotten uh, emails from uh, uh, disturbingly, former students of mine at Harvard, so these are, 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 are no dummies, mm -hmm. uh, from um, uh, 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 young men in tech, uh, Jamie Damore being an example, not that I've ever contacted him, but he's almost a, a, a prototype. Uh, and they are naturally, because of the suppression of, uh, uh, of uh, speech and debate, the alt-right becomes their congenial uh, yeah. landing site. And that, that, and that's they feed each other on what else is being kept uh, in, the, in the dark by the, the libtards, the, the lefties, <laughs> and so on. I, yeah. Indeed, and they can say that there are certain things that are, you know, that, that the, the academic uh, mainstream can't handle the truth, and, and you know, there's a, there's a sense in which they're, they're right. Uh, but then uh, those ideologies can kind of fester without the proper uh, immune response, yeah. and the result is that you have uh, intelligent people voting for a, you know, bizarrely dangerous and unqualified uh, candidate for president. Uh, anyway, so those remarks were then uh, doctored so that only the part that says that, w in which I noted that there are uh, intelligent and educated members of the alt-right, which I know for a fact because some of them were, were Harvard students. Yeah. Um, uh, and Milo Yiannopoulos went to Cambridge. Yeah. Uh, an yeah. Another yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, uh, and th that was then doctored and presented both on left-wing sites and, and right-wing sites as a kind of uh, support for the alt-right, whereas it was actually a, a tactic for starving the alt-right. So you, the, 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 so, so sensitive, so hypersensitive, raw are the culture wars that you would suddenly 
being accused by the left of being right-wing because the right-wing had edited everything you had said, yes. adopted For, it. Fortunately, the, both the, the Guardian and the New York Times came to my defense. There was actually an article in the, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times about how social media are making us stupid and used that as the, the way that I was taken out of context as a, a prime I, example. I might be very stupid in saying that in the same way at the very beginning you said what language taught you about um, what's programmed, what's coded within us, how language is a faculty, uh, allowed you to put that idea out into other human faculties. And actually, isn't that what formalism and structuralism uh, that then became the postmodernism that you so decry and deplore, isn't that what they did? They said, let's look at language as a kind of structure yep. and let's use what we know about language, including phonology and um, uh, phonemes, and apply them to social activity, hence the eme uh, suffix becoming such a common thing now that we find, you know, mythemes and, of course, memes that Richard Dawkins coined, that they did the same thing. They took the intellectual idea of study of language and said, society is a kind of language. It has the same sorts of rules. It's the same idea. But this is something, of course, you fundamentally disagree with, is postmodern thinking on, yeah. on society. And I wondered if you could just elaborate on that and why you think it's so, so deleterious to, yes. to, to our culture. No, you're right. There was a, a, a kind of circuitous route by which the structural linguistics of Roman Jakobson and Trubetskoy so, so, yeah. uh, so, sir, then, yeah. then got um, uh, uh, ported over into anthropology by Claude Lady Strauss. Yeah. Uh, and then to uh, Marxism with Althusser and so on. Yeah. Uh, indeed. Yeah. And then and then taken into the uh, I think rather uh, um, uh, eccentric uh, position that. Uh, thought consists of nothing but arbitrary um, oppositions in self-contained symbol systems, although the structuralism then became post-structuralism, yes. which uh, uh, in, in fairly abstruse and uh, uh, ways uh, abandoned the uh, exact propositions of structural linguistics yeah. and anthropology, but still it retained the idea which then got carried over into uh, uh, Derrida's deconstructionism, that all statements are inherently um, paradoxical or circular because they're just uh, symbols that refer to other symbols that refer to other symbols in a kind of closed circle. But what it left out of the entire discussion in uh, the, 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 the entire course of modern linguistics is there's not just syntax and phonology, but there's also semantics. That is, language refers to stuff. Yes. Uh, and um, that, that got left out. It refers to stuff both because uh, it's connected to the world via uh, perception. Uh, we actually, um, uh, our linguistic symbols like dog and table um, aren't just defined in like a dictionary definition uh, in, in terms of uh, you know, an animal and mammal, but they also, you know, they're little pictures in the dictionary. Yes. Uh, and they, our, our perceptual system connects us to reality. And they're also connected to a web of inference of um, logical conclusions that we can draw that uh, make uh, meaning not completely arbitrary, but uh, enmeshed with our scientific understanding of the world. The fact that a, a dog is a mammal and a mammal is a, a living thing. These aren't just arbitrary symbols, but they actually have content. And that widens out socially into, I suppose, the argument between relativism and, what is the opposite of relativism? Real, it, real, just, realism. You'd say realism, of course, yes. they would say absolutism. <laughs> yes, right. No, realism, a scientific yeah. realism, which is the, the philosophy of science, that scientific uh, propositions are actually about something, they're actually about yeah. the world, and they can be true or false. So, Even, you know, because, just to sort of finish off, in, in a way, one of the things we've started to learn, those of us who are curious about neuroscience, uh, is that since you started writing even, one of the things that's become even more apparent to David Eagleton and Kahneman and Tversky and, and, and all these others have shown us how contingent our knowledge is. Um, but they've taken ideas obvious ideas we grew up with, like um, illusions, you know, uh, I I pictures, you know, are they two faces or a candlestick, or is this a straight line, you know. We realize how our brain is interpreting reality in a very non-realist way. Um, and so we also now realize that reason itself is not stable or reliable. It seems very fragile. You write brilliantly about some of the experiments that show intelligent, liberal people who believe in evolution don't actually understand it. And if they're asked a few questions, uh, which is true, they will often get it wrong on the basis of their misunderstanding of basic Darwinism. And so 
you kind of think, well, maybe there's something in this, not necessarily Derrida or Lacan or Foucault or the, any particular of these idiot, idiotic Frenchmen whose greatest... <laughs> well, if, if only they could write. Roland Barthes could write, so you could believe in him because he wrote beautifully. But they write so badly, they can't be true. Sort of <laughs> must be true. But, um, uh, but nonetheless, this idea that our, that our reality is not what it seems and... Yeah and that, that somehow you're being scientistist, you're, being a, you know, you're, you're guilty of scientism, you're, you're too cold and real, and actually life is more fragile and ethereal and strange and difficult. Um, yes. well, how well, do you answer well, that? Life is fragile and strange and, and uh, will always have be, be mystifying, but uh, when, we, uh, when we develop policies, when we develop institutions, especially ones that, that wield power, we ought, must to the best of our ability, root them in reason and, and scientific reality, which is the never going to be absolute, but is the uh, only reality that we can uh, approach. And, and crucially, uh, you, you invoked people in my own profession, like Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, yeah. um, who of course have shown the limitations of, of human reason, that we're, we're vulnerable to illusions the, the, the and biases. biases. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, but the, and, uh, and I note that there's a, a false conclusion that some people draw that this is a refutation of the Enlightenment belief that we're all, that we're completely rational. Now the Enlightenment thinkers were adamant that we're not rational. Uh, they were some of the, 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 the best students of human quirks and follies and people like Adam Smith and David Hume and, and uh, Spinoza just went to town with our, our, our emotional yeah. um, uh, passions uh, are, are the, the fallacies that we're, we're, we're vulnerable to. Uh, but the, the, uh, what I take to be the point of the Enlightenment emphasis on reason is not that uh, uh, every person is inherently rational, but that we, we do have some uh, capacity for rationality, and we must if we're even discussing the question, because the only way you could say humans uh, are irrational is if you had some benchmark of rationality against which to compare them, otherwise yes. the question itself would be meaningless. So yes, compared and, to ladybirds or compared to uh, uh, bears. Well, also that, that when, when people uh, make some fallacy, like taking a, a stereotype, the prototypical example would be uh, uh, Linda. violates the, the laws of uh, probability because the probability of a uh, conjunction always has to be less than or equal to the probability of uh, one of the um, conjuncts. So since all feminist <laughs> bank tellers are bank tellers, it's actually impossible for it to be more likely that she's a feminist bank teller than a bank teller <laughs> because they're all... Now this, of course... Now, <laughs> Now, the, 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 yeah. the fact that I can explain it, yeah. and that they explained yeah. it, that they called it a fallacy, we called it a fallacy like compared to what? Compared to laws of logic and probability, which you know, they could understand, so at least they're rational. Anyone yeah. who reads them can understand them, so the people who read it are rational. So it's a mistake to say that we're incapable of rationality, yeah. even if it doesn't come easy to us. But does it mean that we have to submit, because I'm sure I'm not alone in this room of finding your splendid, almost Bertrand Russell-like uh, uh, use of logic there. Um, I can't, oh God, that's what happens when I read philosophy. I have to turn back two pages. Yeah, I've got it, I've got it. Turn the page. I've lost it again. Go back. <laughs> oh, damn. What was the proposition? What was the postulate? What was the syllogism? What was the, oh, uh, you know, and, and uh, in, even in your, I have to say, your wonderful graphs that you and your, uh, the, your, your friend here Max uh, Rosa, produced, yeah. um, Suddenly, a word like percentile will, or quantile <laughs> will come up, and if it ends in aisle, I, I don't know what it means. <laughs> What's the difference in a percentage and a percentile? And I'm obviously, in, and so I have to basically say, Stephen knows what he's talking about. I, <laughs> I, I assume he's right. And in a sense, some people would argue that that's no different to the hermeneutic uh, exegesis that, uh, that the priest and the hier you know, the hierophant is, 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 is explaining to their obedient flock. Yes. I can, only I can interpret these facts. And, and the moment you start to use words that are from science and from logic, most of us go, uh, I, can, I can sort of followed it. And then you said conjunct. 
Oh, I, yes, okay. Then yeah. I lost it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, yes, so, so to the, the extent in which it, it, it feels like that, then, then there's been a, a fail, that I failed. <laughs> because it has <laughs> to be. Richard because Feynman be, would have claimed that he could explain it to an 11 year old if it was. Well, physics. That, that's, that is the yeah. aspiration. Yeah. And, it, and it, indeed, it would be completely contrary to the spirit of science for scientists to be considered to be some, some uh, uh, priesthood. Yeah. It's got to be that you might have to put a little work into it, but you can reconstruct the logic it's for all yourself. Of, yeah. It must yeah. be. And so the, the, the overall principle is that, that um, we uh, obviously are uh, capable of reason, just to have the, this discussion in the first place, and that there are norms and institutions that can uh, foster reason uh, collectively, if not necessarily individually in, in each one of us. So uh, norms such as uh, free speech, that if you uh, say something, someone else is allowed to criticize it, so you can't yeah. rest on authority, such as empirical testing, um, such as uh, peer review, such as double-blind studies, all of the, uh, in the court of law, standards of evidence, standards of, of, uh, uh, of, of justice, yeah. um, fact-finding commissions, journalistic um, ethics, all of the principles that make us collectively smarter than any of us individually uh, would be. Um, and, and that's what we have to uh, uh, rely upon, not any assumption that any individual in isolation is particularly wise or yes. rational. I mean, in the end, I'm always prepared to believe a mathematician or a scientist because they can say, at three minutes past 11 on the 23rd of June in the year 2031, <laughs> yes. there will be an eclipse here. And yeah. if you want, they'll show you they're working. Exactly. And I've never heard a priest or a, a, a <laughs> spiritualist ever ever predict anything like that. Yeah, or true. I'd switch the switch and the light goes on. It, it, it almost seems magic to me, but I know that if I were to study long enough, I would find the chain of reasoning, the chain of discovery that has led to that light turning on, whereas everything else is either magical thinking or mystery or uh, you know, a sort of hidden, you have to believe without being shown the working. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And there is, in terms of the um, arcane technical vocabulary yeah. being inaccessible to uh, you know, a wide um, lay readership, that itself changes over time because there has been a steady trickle down of technical concepts from scientists and scholars and, and policy wonks into conventional understanding. And that may even be one of the drivers of uh, perhaps the most bizarre uh, index of progress uh, or example of progress, the Flynn effect, the rise in IQ scores over the, the decades uh, by about three IQ points per decade, resulting in a cumulative improvement of about 30 IQ points over the century. Uh, and one of the explanations is ha how that could happen, given that uh, it's not like we've... Uh, they read your books. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've read... People, people have, re have, have uh, read books and had access to some of what started out as arcane ideas that then kind of proliferate through the, the population. And so ideas that we even take for granted now started out as pretty exotic uh, concepts. So just an example, you know, nowadays if someone said, well, I, um, I, I ate some uh, uh, dandelions and my, uh, my headache doesn't bother me anymore. And you say, oh, that's, that's probably just a placebo effect. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, yes. it's just a placebo. Now, that, the placebo effect was at one point a fairly exotic concept in epidemiology, yeah. but now most educated people kind of know what it is, yeah. or a correlation versus ca causation. Win-win yeah. uh, um, situation, uh, yes. trade-off, market. Zero-sum game. Zero-sum game. Yeah. Uh, These are th things we're familiar with, which are quite, with, I mean, really quite complex ideas, uh, might have been considered 100 years ago, needing a lot of explanations. Zero sum was, came out of game theory, yes. a fairly yeah. arcane branch yeah. of mathematics. Yeah. So what can happen is with education and also not, not just education in school, but in um, proliferation of ideas through you know, the, the BBC Morphic and residence. magazines yes. and, or, and, and websites <laughs> yeah. and, and so on that, uh, that, that the kind of baseline understanding can be smarter, uh, can become smarter, and so more sophisticated concepts become part of the conventional wisdom. Well, I have to say, as you saw, I got given a note here, and we've talked, so I, I could go on forever. I just love talking to you. I, I love the way you, you just open things up, and if enlightenment has that word light in it, and you, you do show us, uh, you know, you show light on all kinds of areas of our thinking and our behavior, and, and I, I do want to thank you and want to tell everybody here that um, Stephen will be uh, spending 20 minutes signing copies of the book, um, but I know you'll want to join me in thanking him for his fascinating conversation. Thank you very much.